Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 843 of the Juicebox Podcast. Today I'll be speaking with Lisa. She is the mother of a child with type 1. She owns a daycare center, and she writes for her local newspaper about type 1 diabetes. While you're listening today, please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box Podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. Do you have type 1 diabetes or are you the caregiver of someone with type 1? If you were to complete the survey at t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box, you would be helping with type 1 diabetes research. This survey is simple. It is easy. It is HIPAA compliant. It is anonymous. And it will take you about 10 minutes. t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. Join the registry. Complete the survey. That's it. Just like that, you've helped. If you're looking for the Diabetes Pro Tip series, they begin at episode 210 in your podcast player or you can find a complete list at juiceboxpodcast.com or in the feature tab of the private Facebook group, Juicebox Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juicebox. Today's podcast is also sponsored by the Dexcom G6. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Check it out. See if you're eligible for a free 10-day trial of the Dexcom G6. See your blood sugar speed, direction, and number all in one place on your receiver or smartphone. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. I am Lisa Seitels. I am a mother of four children, uh, a wife to my husband, Sam, and I own uh, Reed Preschool and Camp Tuscaloosa here in Hammonton, New Jersey. You have a preschool. That's interesting. Yes. Wow. Um, how old are your children, top to bottom? So Jaden is nine. Casey is seven. Ashton is turning five in August. And Sora is turning three in August. Which one has type one? Casey, my seven-year-old. Casey does. And you started a daycare just because you had so many kids. It was the only way you could afford to take care of your kids. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, this place has been in existence since 1954. Um, and my husband and I uh, took it over six years ago. I see. Okay. But well, it is, yes, it is beautiful to have my four children go through my own program. That's very true. Yeah. Well, and, you, and you're not paying somebody. I'm assuming you don't charge yourself. No, no. They're, <laughs> they're here for free. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'm just saying you have enough kids that that's a financially viable idea. Like, hey, we could either pay for daycare or just buy a daycare. I think it's probably cheaper to buy one. <laughs> that's funny. Um is there any autoimmune in your family? Do you have thyroid issues or anybody in your connected um, extended family? Um, not at all. Um, uh, Sam, I guess in his uh, more further out family has um, some people with type one, um, but they're like half siblings of other people in the family. So to us, uh, Casey getting type 1 diabetes was an absolute shock. It okay. is not in the immediate family at so all. Nothing you were aware of, but certainly there's a genetic connection. It, it seems so if we go off of the half uh, sibling a few generations above us. Yeah. Yes. Counts to me. Uh, how about other people with other autoimmune issues? Um, I don't think so. Um. Not that we're really aware of okay. now. Okay. Uh, so how old was Casey when he was diagnosed? Casey was five. It was two weeks before his sixth birthday. Oh, and, and this is during COVID? Yes. Okay. Um, how bad was it and how did you figure it out? Was it like one of those things where you just noticed something weird and followed up with a doctor or was he in DK? So... It's a very uh, actually interesting story is um, in my first article that I wrote for the newspaper uh, describes it. 
but he um, had all these symptoms and, but they, you know, as for most people, you know, unless you're aware of type one, they all seem like separate and unrelated. And, um, you know, I, it just started with me noticing um, that he seemed to be losing his baby fat. You know, he's always been uh, my child that had a little bit more like, you know, to him. And one day I said, Sam, doesn't he look like he's losing his baby fat? And Sam's like, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe. And then, and that was actually like, you know, a few months before uh, we discovered he was type one. But then it got to the point where um, my three boys like to bunk together and, you know, one of them or all of them, I wasn't sure who who was wedding head. And so after like a while this happening, I was like, okay, we got to like figure out who's doing this. So I separated them out. And I realized it was Casey and like, I was concerned because, you know, he's, you know, he was almost six and be wetting the bed to the degree, like picked up a sheet and it was drip. Like it was head to toe. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in the meantime, he was also like having to drink milk like every 10 minutes and he had scratches on his face that I'm like, why aren't these healing? And he, it got to the point where we had a play date and he's just like, he went on the couch, sat down, covered his head. And I'm like, what are you doing, Casey? Like you have friends over right now. And he's like, Oh, I'm just tired. I'm going to rest. And I was like, that is interesting and strange, but okay. And then, um, it got to the point where he came down to our school. Um, we had opened our school to older ages during COVID. And so that allowed him to be in the school again. And my staff member came up to me and said, uh, Casey's really tired today. I'm going to, you know, just let him rest. And I looked over at him and he was lying on the couch in a ball. And I was like, something is wrong. Like something's not right. Like his best friend is here. Like this is, this is never going to be like my son, like, you know, declining to play or engage. So I took him upstairs And he, and I started, I was like, I'll do your work with you up here while you just, you know, hang out with me. And, and he fell asleep. Like I'm talking, like he was like awake and then his eyes closed and I was like, wow. Okay. Like he must be really tired. So when he was sleeping, I Googled his symptoms because there were just too many of them that were concerning me. And type one was the first thing to pop up, but because it doesn't run in my family you know, to my knowledge. And, um, I just never imagined that he would have that. Mm -hmm. So I re-googled his symptoms and it said, Oh, like urinary tract infection. And I was like, okay, I don't really think it's that. And then, um, I thought to myself, well, we'll take him to a doctor, you know? So he napped, he woke up later. He seemed to be feeling a little bit better. So, uh, he was set to stay with a friend of ours for a few hours um, that night because Sam and I had a COVID shot. We had to go and we didn't want to bring all the kids. And she happens to be type 1 diabetic. And so we took two kids to her house, two kids to another friend's house. And when we came back to pick him up, I had just told her ahead of time. I never mentioned I Googled anything. I never even mentioned type 1. I, I just didn't cross my mind that it could be. And when we picked him up, Sam gets in the car and and he says, Steph thinks that Casey's diabetic. And the minute he said that, like all the alarm bells went off because that's what had popped up on Google. And yeah, that and you, I had and you been just like, kind of said, oh, no, it's not that. Right. How yes. That? And I was just I was terrified. Yeah. And I had read about ketoacidosis. So I I knew it could be serious. And so we got home and I started calling like people and, um, you know, his teacher was like, you know, if, if you're really concerned, maybe you should just go to the hospital, you know, don't wait to see a doctor tomorrow. And I called my mom. She's actually been a uh, person in the diabetes field for 10 years. Um, and she publishes papers on it. And I said to her I, how scared I was, like, what if he's in ketoacidosis? And she said, you know, take him back to Steph's house and have her test him with her um, blood meter. And so we drove him right there. I left Sam with the other kids. 
I took him there. She tested him and she had like, well, I, I don't know if I've ever seen one of these since then, but she had this alarm that flashed and I will never forget it. It flashed. She grabbed my arm and looked at me in absolute terror. And she said, this is not good. And in that moment, I thought my son was going to die. I, I thought I was going to lose him and I burst into tears and she retested him to be sure. And his blood sugar was 676. Yeah. And, uh, and she herself as a type one had never seen a blood sugar that high. So we immediately rushed him to the emergency room. I ran in there like, you know, we've never been admitted so fast because I could literally say like, he's type one, he needs to be on an IV now. And um, he was later transferred to a much better hospital and they told me that if he had gone one other night, they don't think he would have woken up. Wow. Well, Lisa, that's a lot. That is a, a lot to go through. And uh, you were able to get in no problem, even though it was COVID time. They got you right in the hospital. Yes. Um, thankfully, he went right in. And I just remember, like, it, there was so much in those few days that we were admitted in the hospital. And I had grown up with a, um, a family friend who's a diabetes type one for about 50 years. Hey, Lisa, so you I cut out for a second. Him. Lisa, I'm sorry. You cut out for a second. You grew up with a family friend. What? Who has had type one diabetes for now going on about 50 years. Okay. He got in his twenties. I want to stop. And... You for, can I stop you for a second here before you tell me about that? Because there was one yes. thing about the previous part of your conversation that threw me for a loop. So, um, you said that there's, you didn't, think about diabetes because there was no connection to your family. You didn't know anybody that had it in your family. But then when you said your mom worked in the field, I have to admit that confused me. So what does your mom do now? So she, um, she is a professor of education and she, so it actually ties into this friend I was about to tell you about. Ahead, He's yeah. a family friend. He's had diabetes for 50 years and I've known him for 35 of those. And so she, after observing him, you know, over the years, realized that type one diabetes is like a job. And she's like written, you know, she's in the education field. She writes descriptions of like, what does it take to like do certain jobs? And um, in the case of type one, there's no days off. There's no like, you know, holidays or there's no nights off. There's just no time off period. And she realized that to take care of type one is, is at least as complicated as, as a middle level job. Mm -hmm. So if you think about like what you have to do to respond to type one during the day, during the night, all the unpredictable factors involved, like treating a problem, do we even know what the solution is to the problem right now? You know, she what does it compare to being a lawyer? How does it compare to being a custodian? How does it compare to this? And it's a very complicated job that people don't sign up for and they don't want either. So the rate of noncompliance for caring for type one can be like sort of low. And so her like goal over this time has been to like spread awareness about how complicated type one is and to help, you know, people in the medical field to almost like like realize that this is a serious job that people aren't going to comply with unless you you know break it down to like their individual needs and and levels mm -hmm. and they can you know understand exactly what's involved and have the support that they need to comply i see yeah it, the idea i guess being that you know, it, it, you get thrown into a thing, your ex, your understanding of it is not good. You might not be, I mean, intellectually prepared for it. And then all of a sudden it's life and death. It's very important. The doctor sends you on the way out the door thinking, oh, I explained everything to them. And then if you don't have good outcomes, their expectation is often that you didn't try when really you were never set up for any kind of success to begin with. And now you're at odds kind of quietly it's interesting isn't it like quietly at odds because the doctor believes you're not paying attention but they don't really say it to you and you yes. think you think you're failing and you don't really ever say that out loud either it's uh yes. yeah you get into a bad communication loop 
Yes, exactly. And like one of the things that I realized in those days at the hospital is I said, I just don't know how someone that's never graduated high school, for instance, can take in all this information. Like my first article says like, you know, I'm a smart person, but to suddenly have to learn how to become like a clinician for your child 24 seven to prevent them from dying on possibly an hourly basis is, and then go back to full life at full pace and all your other obligations and distractions. Like it's, yeah. it's a job that like they're sending you out to do it with like almost no preparation. And they're throwing all this information at you like, Oh, you should be able to absorb this in about three days over six hours. Yeah. And it's not the case. You leave the hospital feeling terrified Mm -hmm. and knowing that you have, you know, so much that you still have yet to learn so much that you don't understand. It's frightening. And in some cases, like we did, we had like almost no support from the medical field when we left because our insurance uh, was ending the one we had it. the, The company had gone bankrupt. So we suddenly had to go to a different insurance that no longer accepted that hospital and to get an appointment at the next hospital took months. So we were literally left hanging and we relied on people in our town, um, our friend, like my mom, who has more knowledge than the average person to help us, you know, get through this and even like emotionally support us. And it was at that time that I realized I was sitting down like about four to five months later, just absolutely inside distraught and very aware that I had had, I thought I knew about type one because I grew up with someone who had it, seeing them for 35 years. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, I realized I had zero understanding of type one. And I felt terrible that here was this friend of ours living this day in and day out in front of my very eyes. And I had no clue about what he was going through until my son was diagnosed. And when I realized that, I said, I have to do something. I have to spread awareness. I have to prevent someone else's child from going into DKA. And like, I have to like make it known that like all these misperceptions about type one out there like they need to be cleared up. I mean, I remember when Casey was diagnosed, my husband and I said, did we feed him too much sugar? You know, and clearly that's not the case, but like the responses we got for like, you know, well, how did he get it over time? Like, you know, that there's a lot of people that don't understand it. And there was a, uh, a piece in my first article where I like had to convey what type one means. And by the time I get to the end of the article, I said, it's like you're holding a literal heartbeat in your hands and you're the number one barely trained doctor. And I say, wouldn't you want to be a perfectionist too? Because a heartbeat is basically in, in that scenario, I was comparing it to the, a pancreas. You need it to live. You yeah. need it to survive every single day. And if you're not monitoring it, then you lose the life. Lisa, I, I used to, um, a couple things. I used to say that in the beginning when my kid was first diagnosed, it felt like I was in charge of her breathing and that I had to literally say, breathe in, breathe out. And if I forgot to say it, she wouldn't breathe. Like it, it felt like that. It felt like that was my responsibility. Um, yes. And to make you feel a little better, maybe about having a, you know, a lifelong like person you knew with diabetes, but then didn't see the diabetes in your own kid. My best friend was diagnosed with type one when we were like 17 or 18. And I mean, I don't just mean like a good friend of mine. I mean, you know, like I walked outside, he was waiting for me. He walked outside. I was waiting for him. There were very few things we didn't do together. When we had girlfriends, we dated together. Like we were together all the time. He had diabetes. Mm -hmm. This was the late eighties and early nineties. And he was very private about it. And I guess even to call it private might be a misnomer. I just think there wasn't much for him to do, right? He shot like regular an MPH in the morning and at, and at dinner time. He didn't really do much else other than that. But it wasn't for literally weeks and weeks after Arden was diagnosed that I thought, oh, Mike has this. I didn't even make that correlation. 
like a person I was around constantly who had type 1 diabetes. And then, I don't know how many years later, 16 years later, my daughter gets it. And it never entered my mind that my best friend has it. It, it just, it, I don't know. It just, it never did. So, and now you're having a, an incredibly common reaction uh, to, a, to a new diagnosis. This feeling of wanting to go out into the world and make sure everyone knows everything. You know, and to say that you're maybe the, you know, thousandth person I've met who's had this feeling, who's done something about it is probably an understatement. There's probably been more. Um, can you talk a little bit about the specific drive that makes you want to do that? Is it, is it, is it that you thought you're, you were going to lose your son and you're trying to save somebody else from being in that situation? So it's, I guess, a variety of things. Um, first of all, I don't ever want anybody to lose a child if they can prevent that. Uh, it, just the fact that we could have lost Casey was absolutely traumatizing. So there's definitely that involved. The other factors are that I realized that when I didn't see what my friend goes through, I realized that diabetes is such a silent disease. Like so many people deal with it without the public eye really having a clue of what's going on behind the scenes mm -hmm. that that is partly why it's sort of like almost stigmatized is something that, Oh, it's no big deal, you know, but it, it's, it's a very serious deal. And so I wanted to dispel the kind of thought process um, that the general public might have of one, like what is type one, you know, you don't get it because you ate too many desserts and two, um, uh, you know, what people are actually going through behind the scenes that no one is ever witnessing. Like I didn't really witness too much with my friend and I knew personally what it felt like to go through this process so I, so like my articles that are published monthly are basically um, mine and Casey's journey and Sam and what happens is something that I'll write about. And I want other families to feel that they're understood, that, you know, they can, you know, be related to somebody else feeling exactly the way they are, yeah. or they might learn something from my articles that they didn't know. Um, since I started writing, I mean, I've put some on your page. I haven't put all of them, although if you don't have a problem with it, I, I share just, you know, to help people, but I've put some on your page or other pages um, for parents of type one diabetics and the feedback I've gotten from them is is absolutely heartwarming and amazing. I've had people write me saying like, I'm like a savior in their lives for giving advice or um, like, thank you so much. Like no one in my family or my friends understands what we're going through. Can I share your article? Like this will help them understand our reality. Um, I've had people, um, I've actually had people, I've met people that live within my vicinity that have type one. Some of them even, or the kids have type one, some of them even from Hamilton itself that read my article and are like, oh my gosh, like you're not that far from us. So it's also brought me some like really nice connections yeah. so that, you know, I can support people here and, and the, the thing that's amazing about it is in writing um, to help other people, I never realized that indirectly it would end up helping me. Mm -hmm. um, like my last uh, article that's um, out for publication now is about uh, diabetes distress. And I think pretty much any uh, parent of a type one child is going to go through that. And the, the solution for me that I realized over this time is that in helping other people, it helps me. Yeah. Um, it helps me get through this. And, and I know that if I can make a difference in someone's life, that's amazing. I thought like if, if my article reached one person, maybe it saved one life, even if it's like 10 years from now, someone remembers reading about DKA or whether my article helped one person explain this disease to their family. But in the end, I saw that my articles have ended up helping maybe even hundreds of people, you know, manage through this. 
And like, I couldn't really ask for more than that. Just knowing that I can like maybe make a difference in someone's life. There was the one article I wrote about the meaning behind a diversity. I know that not everybody, you know, wants to feel the need to celebrate a day that a child was diagnosed with a life changing disease. Um, but the article was more of like the perspective of like, well, we can't make this disease disappear, but we can decide how we respond to it. Mm-hmm. And I got almost more feedback on that article um, than even many of the others where people wrote me and said, like, you changed my perspective. Like, I'm going to go bigger on this celebration or I'm going to celebrate now. I wasn't going to before. Like, I literally changed and, and maybe I've impacted someone's life for like 20 diversities to come, you know, whereas before they may never have, you know, looked at that day as something to try to make positive yeah. in some way, you know, Lisa, where do you, where do you write these? Um, I, so I write them and I, so I live in a small town and mm. there's a local newspaper here called the Hamilton Gazette. And um, way back before COVID hit, um, my husband and I were, were writing articles for them about parenting and, and with our experience in child care. And then COVID hit and, you know, I was unable to write. I had to focus on my business. But um, so one day, uh, five months after Casey was diagnosed, I sat down and I just wrote that first article, it poured from my heart right into the keyboard and not one word was changed from the minute I started it to the minute I ended it. Mm -hmm. I emailed it to the Gazette and I said, by no means do you have to accept this article, but I've written this and obviously I'm passionate about spreading awareness and I plan to write more. And basically without any hesitation, I got an email back saying, how should we end this? You know, because at the, bottom of all the articles they say you know lisa yeah. Sitels and sam Sitels are the only to read please go on camp tuscaloosa and they have four children and are active members of the community so i said that was fine and since then she's been publishing my articles i can't even begin to say how grateful i am to her because through her you know publishing them it's allowed me to reach an audience i never thought i would ever reach um and it's and it's made actually other impacts in Hamilton um and in the type one world in ways that are absolutely beautiful it's led to huge fundraising events supported by our town um we just recently did one with uh the Hamilton lions club we're members of the lions club and it was an easter family event to raise money for jbrf Mm -hmm. And the Gazette interviewed us about that as well. And uh, it the event, I remember thinking, I don't know how many people will show up. And before it even hit 10 o'clock, I think it was 9.45 in the morning, a line of cars started coming and it just didn't stop. And when I saw that, I started crying. Yeah. Because the community support was more than like, anyone could ever hope for there ended up being hundreds of people on our property that for that day for this event mm, hundreds it's excellent it it was amazing and we ended up raising seven thousand three hundred dollars wow. for jdrf that's wonderful lisa how aware are you of the podcast you listen to it your podcast yeah 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 yes i so i i really plan to listen to a lot more episodes, but I definitely listened to the ones in the beginning, like where you're, you know, talking about, um, you know, just what the different terminology mm-hmm. means, ex- especially for people just starting out. I just asked, um, I only ask because your story is incredibly similar to mine, except it happens, uh, you know, later, uh, you know, in time and it's backwards as far as where you decided to write. So, most of what you just described happened to me. My daughter was diagnosed. I felt an overwhelming sense of uh, loss and then uh, an incredible responsibility to take good care of her. You become incredibly aware suddenly that other people might not know about this. You want to protect them or maybe put uh, a thought into someone else's head that might help your kid one day. I started to write on a blog 
which was not a thing back then. It's interesting. Like, like blogs were just getting started when I made a blog. And you are starting to write in print, which kind of isn't a thing right now. Like, like, you know what I mean? But you, but you got on it anyway, and it's, it's doing the same thing. I would tell you that in the first year or two that I wrote my blog, I would describe how I reach people the same way as you. If I just reach one person, I think that's wonderful. I couldn't believe when, you know, a hundred people showed up at a thing or something like that. It's very, very similar um, stories, which I just, I really do think that your reaction to diabetes and my reaction to diabetes initially were very similar. They just, they just are. I'm sure that most people have, you know, some variation of a certain feeling that I'm sure there's not a thousand different feelings. There's probably a few different ways people go. You want to get motivated to tell somebody else. It makes you sad. You hunker down like the whole thing. And you, you talked earlier about how, how unfair it is to be thrown into this new job without any training or tools and maybe, and obviously no desire to do it uh, initially. And that you have to go back to your regular life and do this thing. Like you suddenly have two jobs. And I, I've always felt very grateful that when my daughter was diagnosed, I was already a stay at home father. So basically the things that I was supposed to do, if I ignored them, it just meant there was more laundry piled up. Not that I wasn't getting paid at my job that I was paying the bills with. You know what I mean? Like it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's an overlooked thing that people get sent home to go back to their lives and to start a new life. And that these two things have to happen at the same time, but you don't get 24 extra hours in the day or two other hands or eight more hours to sleep or something like that. Really, really. I'm just yeah, fascinated. Exa yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I would say like that, maybe that's like a, a difference between us. Like, like uh, we preschool and camp Tuscaloosa are, are technically like two different businesses. They get different age groups of kids and um, they keep me and Sam working 24 yeah. seven. So I definitely felt overwhelmed. Um, I, not to mention I have four kids total. So, you know, it, it was very overwhelming to me. And we don't have family that lives close to us. My mom is the closest one about an hour, 10 minutes away. Mm -hmm. So we didn't even have like, hell, oh, hey, I can come over and, you know, you know, give you guys, you know, some time to recover or anything like, you know, my I did my mom did come for the first uh, weeks to help out. She's always been like, you know, a huge support for us in every way possible. But you still, it's not like you have like the grandparents that live next door, you know? Right. So it was definitely a lot to, for us to take in. And like, I am grateful that we had families in Hamilton that were like, if you need anything, like, you know, if you need advice or, you know, need to learn how to do anything, like put on a Dexcom. I remember being terrified of putting on a Dexcom the first time. So I had um, my friend come over and do it because her type one daughter you know has been doing this for years more than us and 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 now i feel silly i'm like oh gosh i didn't know how to put on a dexcom yeah. it seems pretty easy right now but it was terrifying because you you there's it's such a high stakes disease that if you mess something up then it's a huge problem certainly can and be. yeah yes and like i think in our journey um, you know, a bunch of my articles like touch on different things, but I think the thing that's like probably traumatized me the most in our journey is um, when a, a doctor made a deadly error with my son and we almost lost Casey again because of that deadly error. And I don't know if you've ever talked to anyone else where a doctor's made such a horrendous mistake before. Well, but, um, we're going to find out in a second, Lisa, because I don't know what you're talking about and I want to hear about it. So um, Casey had had diabetes for how long when this happened? When you have diabetes and use insulin, low blood sugar can happen when you don't expect it. Gvoc Hypopen is a ready-to-use glucagon option that can treat very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes ages 2 and above. Find out more. Go to gvoclucagon.com forward slash juice box. Gvoc shouldn't be used in patients with pheochromocytoma or insulinoma. Visit gvoclucagon.com slash risk.
my daughter has been in college now for a few months and without any exaggeration, I'm not sure how we would have done it without the Dexcom G6. I can see Arden's blood sugar on my phone. I get alerts and alarms if she leaves the range that I set up on my app. And it just brings a peace of mind like uh, I can't really describe, actually. Her blood sugar is 136 right now, and she's doing terrific. She's doing her homework, she's in her dorm room, and she's okay. And I can see that on my phone. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. That information can be shared with up to 10 followers with the Dexcom G6, and you may be eligible for a free 10-day trial of the device. That is something you can find out at my website, dexcom.com forward slash juice box. So get started today or go see about the trial, whatever you want to do. Um, it's up to you, of course, but I'm just going to tell you that Dexcom has been maybe the best partner my daughter has had with diabetes. It's a toss up between Dexcom and Omnipod, I think, all these years. Um, but they both do an amazing job. That said, seeing her blood sugar speed, direction, and number on my smartphone with a flip of my finger, it's pretty great. I think you would enjoy it. Uh, I think it would relieve some of your anxiety. I think it would help you make better decisions about carbs and insulin. You know, just being able to see the blood sugar kind of gives you a feel for what you're doing. Anyway, you should check it out. There are links in the show notes of the podcast player you're listening in now, links at juiceboxpodcast.com, or you can just type this right into a browser, dexcom.com forward slash juicebox. I think you'll be happy that you did. We met this doctor in April. He was um, diagnosed in, so he was diagnosed March 1st. And we met this doctor at the end of April, okay? So it was like two months later. And at the time, um, I was very concerned that I, you know, you know, really didn't have too much of a good feeling about what I was doing to care for my son. It, like diabetes always makes you undermine your self-confidence. Like it undermines it. It makes you question everything. And am I doing this right? And, you know, at this appointment, it was like pretty, like a pretty basic appointment. And um, I had expressed it, that appointment, you know, my son's about to start our summer camp. It's active eight hours a day. I, I'm worried. Like, I don't know how his blood sugar is going to respond to this. And like, really, it was just like, okay, well, we'll see you back three months later in July. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. And so I went and, you know, we went through three more months. His blood sugar was all over the place. Um, thankfully, his nurse at uh, school, uh, her son actually has type one. So I've been blessed in having this amazing person looking out for him at the school. But our camp, you know, it's it's me and Sam. So, um, so basically, when we went back in July, I was very frustrated. I said to the doctor, look. Like I need more diabetes education. I need somebody to like, you know, that actually checks in with me more often. Like I need more and yeah. I need you guys to explain like how the dosing chart works and how, like what these factors are that are affecting my son. Cause I know like activity affects things. Obviously what you eat affects things. Um, illness affects things, et cetera. There's all these like things that you can't always put your finger on. And so I was frustrated and I demanded that. And I also, you know, explained to him how his blood sugars would just like be like so high at various points during the day. So he came back in with a new dosing chart that we were going to follow because we weren't doing the calculation part yet. We would just go off of a dosing chart. Like if he's eating this many carbs, you're going to give him this much insulin. If his blood sugar is this, you'll add that amount of insulin. Right. And we hadn't learned the calculations at that time yet to do it really on our own. So he had this chart and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, okay, you know, it's, it's high, more insulin for, for the carbs, more insulin for the blood sugar. Um, I did, you know, he did say, we're going to try to get those high spikes down. So I was like, okay. And I was, when I left, I was like, gosh, I hope, you know, now I'll feel more confident in managing this condition. 
And so I bring Casey back. I drop him off at the camp. And I and Casey, and all I can say to this day is, thank God my son was not hungry. And he said, I'm not hungry, Mom. I want to just go play at camp. So I sent him off with his counselor. I told Sam, who was on the property, you know, Casey doesn't want to eat right now. He has a new dosing chart with him. Here it is. And I had to go um, take my other son, Jaden, to the eye doctor. So on the way there, I was like, I'll run some errands for the camp and then I'll stop at the eye doctor. So I'm literally sitting in the eye doctor's office four hours later. And the eye doctor is trying to talk to me about my son and I get this phone call and I answer it. And the nurse on the other line says, don't use the new dosing scale. And just like that. And I'm like, what? And she never says like why, right? But I sense in my heart that something is terribly, terribly wrong. Yeah, well, and she's yelling. I said, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I said to her, "It's four hours later. Like I can guarantee you that my husband has used this chart by now. Like it's been four hours." And she said, "Call him now. I'll call you back in ten minutes." And I was like, "Okay." So I called Sam. And he had used it about an hour earlier to dose Casey. And I was just panicked because I still didn't know why, what the problem was, but I knew something was wrong. So I said, Sam, go get him now. Like run like you've never run before and get our son. Mm. And I called his counselor and I said, like, you know, where's Casey? Where's Casey? And she said, oh, we just got out of the pool. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, because the CGM doesn't have a signal in the pool. Right. And so I knew that nobody knew and they wouldn't know for the next 30 minutes, probably what his blood sugar was in that moment. And so I said, rush him to Sam now, like stat. And so Sam gets to him. And by that time, Casey is struggling to get up the stairs to our house. Like he's crying. He's like disoriented. Like my husband's telling me this later and I'm terrified because I'm not even there. Yeah. And he can barely climb the stairs. And my husband uses the manual tester to test him. And his blood sugar is 26. Yeah. And my husband just starts having him chug juice. Like you can't believe. And um, it took... I don't even know a while until Casey's blood sugar finally climbed back up to 71. Right. And in the meantime, the nurse calls me back and she says, did you get a hold of him? And I said, yeah, I did. I said, Casey's blood sugar was 26 and he just got out of the pool. And she says, Oh no, I am so sorry. This is our fault. I am so, so sorry. And I said to her, I'm not going to lie to you right now, but I'm completely traumatized. Like my son could have blacked out in the pool. He could have blacked out after he got out of the pool. And like, I don't know, like, you know, people have told us that they don't even know if we could have gotten to him fast enough with like the, like the glucagon or any of that with that kind of low blood sugar. And, and she's like, well, let me call your husband right now. Like, and talk to him. So she called him and, you know, assess how Casey was doing. And she had told me the doctor would call me back. So the doctor eventually calls me and I relate everything to him. And he's like, I'm so sorry. Like, this is our fault. And I said to her, like him, I said, how did this happen? You know, like, and, and he's like, well, I, a nurse took the wrong scale out of a binder. And I'm like, what? Yeah, and, because this passed before his eyes, you know, it passed before her eyes. It, or did you just hand me something from a binder and not look at it? Right. You know, so I thought to myself, like, you know, every single person in that practice is liable for my son almost dying right now. And I, I just couldn't believe it. And he's like, well, you know, his care will be under a different nurse from now on. But in my head, I'm like, and also it will be under a different doctor from now on. <laughs> you know, like this is not okay with sure. me. And I just remember uh, I finally got home. Like when I got to Casey, I just like, like you know, hugged him like can't believe. And, and then it took, a, and then I had to make sure, you know, over that time and, you know, through the night that that insulin wasn't still like working. We had to give him like more carbs and like stop his activity at camp, obviously. 
because the scale, it, when, once you added the extra insulin for the carbs and the extra insulin for the blood sugar, it was at least five times as much insulin get, being given to him than before. And as you got higher up the scale, sometimes it would, it would like the highest it would be, would be like nine times as much insulin. Like if you wow. got that high up the scale, wow. which thank God we didn't. No. And, and it, it was just like an astounding difference between yeah. what they were giving before. Like, and we all know that half a unit of insulin one way or the other can, or even a unit can like cause some serious effects. So if you get to like five times the insulin or more, like he basically had handed us a death sentence and was having us give Casey that sentence by, cause obviously we're injecting him with that insulin. Yeah, ourselves. I have a question. So do you recall like going back to that time, like for instance, what uh, a unit was to cover um, and then how much a unit was to cover after they gave you the new scale? Um, gosh, I think that's in my article. I'd have to like look back at the article to honestly say like what it was off memory, right. but I do believe but I put it in the article. Was of it what? A, I'm sorry. Was it enough that you, that it was like startling or were you so new at it that it wouldn't have mattered? Like you didn't have the, you didn't have the ability so, to think through it at that point. So looking back so as, as an unexperienced person that was like, I need diabetes education, I need this and that, I didn't see it when he handed me that chart. Like I, I was just too new to this. And and that's and where it comes in actually that it how his life ended up being saved by, by that nurse calling is she told me a few months later when I actually met her in person that she called because of my request for diabetes education and understanding the scale. Like she had just seen the notice, I guess, in her computer, mm -hmm. sat down to look at this chart, do calculations. And she's like, wait, something's not right. None of this makes sense. And that's when she called me in a panic. If I hadn't requested diabetes education and help with that chart, my son might not be alive today. Like I really couldn't say. And yeah. The, the when I look back at it now, like way more experienced, I would definitely say like five times as much much insulin to correct like you know some high blood sugars during the day. That's too much. Like like I think the max dose we would ever have given Casey um, at that time, I think was like three units or so. You know now he maybe gets up to like if he's going like all out pizza, ice cream, party day, you know, maybe he'll get six units, but something like that was above that. Right. Like that would have been like, you know, at this point in my experience level, a huge red flag. Sure. So it's just that like these, I was supposed to like trust these people who are supposed to know way more than I know yeah. about this disease <clears throat> only like five months in. What? And it got to the point where my type one friend who had, is responsible for saving Casey's life, she said to me, wow, 100% responsibility for his condition is st staggering because you now have to question his medical team. You have to leave wondering, is this accurate? Like you, you lost that confidence that you're supposed to have in the medical team. Can I ask you? Have they had, I mean, did you leave them pretty soon after that? So I switched um, location. Um, I never went back after that. So I, my... I switched location. I travel over an hour to get to this new hospital for him. Yeah. I Because there's nothing really close to that our insurance accepts. And it's under um, the, a team that is just completely the opposite. Um, when we first sat down with them, they gave us diabetes education they asked us well what do you know explain to us what you know so that they could see well do you know what you think you know so we did that um they they went over stuff that we hadn't really learned well yet they went over like you know more stuff on nutrition they answered all our questions and they helped us they gave us um pediatric supplies that i could not get under our insurance like it is crazy to me in this day and age that I am being denied pediatric, 
pediatric supplies for my type one son. So what we ended up doing sometimes was we couldn't use a pen to inject Casey because he was only on half unit doses, like increments. Right. And the u- pens came in one unit. So they wouldn't even give us half unit syringes either. So I would have to take a one unit syringe, put it into a pen, pull out, you know, whatever the half unit, one and a half units by the half unit, mm-hmm. inject it into Casey. And then the pen, of course, is no longer valid because you punctured it. So it can never be used as a pen again. So even if one day he was like, oh, he just needs one unit insulin, I can't give it to him from the pen. I still have to use a needle. So- and it was like these crazy things that I'm going through between his medical team, insurance stuff. It, it got to the point where I was like, is this the norm for families with type one? Is this just like crazy, unlucky me? Because if this is the norm, like it's completely unacceptable. But has that like, been a hundred years in? Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. Has that been the case at the new place or has the new place been better? So the new place um, has definitely been better. Um, the one thing that irked me is that we got a letter from them saying that they were unable to negotiate a contract with the current insurance we had. And so they were going to no longer be able to accept it. So on a dime, I had to suddenly switch to insurance yeah. and which meant that I had to switch pharmacy, medical supply company, and even like figure out like sometimes like at last minute that, oh, his Dexcom is no longer going to come from, you know, this one durable medical supply. Now it's a pharmacy prescription, like things like it was, everything was a mess. And I swear you not, as soon as I get two weeks in on this new insurance, I got a letter saying, oh, never mind. You know, we've renegotiated. We'll continue to accept so, it. So and I was t- like, you've two- got to be kidding me. <laughs> two thoughts. Are you serious? <laughs> Give me, let me have two thoughts. First thing is, I, I wondered if the new place was better medically, but the insurance thing, it wasn't what I was wondering. But I will tell you this, and this is a good thing for all of you to know. Hospitals will use their patients the way television programs use their viewers when they think they're going to get canceled. So this is a com- this is common practice. So like if your TV, your favorite TV show looks like it's not going to be renewed by wherever it's on, Netflix or somewhere, then the TV show will go out into the public and say, you know, tweet to this person, make noise on social media, tell people you want to watch the show, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've seen this a number of times. I'm comfortable enough saying that this is true. When hospitals can't get contracts with insurance companies, they gin up the patient population. They get them upset to try to get them to yell at the insurance companies. I, I've seen oh, this happen yes. a couple of times. It's really shady, um, but it definitely goes on. So if they think a big insurance company's shake, you know, it, really, it's never about, well, it's not usually about not re-upping. It's usually about contract money. And so they try, the hospitals will try to sick the patients on the insurance company to get public opinion moved in their direction. Um, you, you used to see it a lot when we were younger. The cable companies would send you a text and say, you're not going to have FX anymore after June 30th. And, you know, if you're not happy about that, somebody better call, you know, Cox Cable and let them know. Or You, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah, and I yeah. mean, I can totally see that happening. Oh, yeah, I guarantee that's what happened there. Um, yes. But, but my question was more about medically. The, the new place medically is more stable and has better advice? Yes, and in fact, I finally, at his last visit, which wasn't that long ago, I finally got the doctor I want. She has type 1 diabetes, and she even has the same pump as him. And she's so sweet, and she's so friendly, and... I was like, finally, you know, my son finally has someone that understands what he's going through, can like, you know, give him like emotional support and not just say, see him in the office. And then 10 minutes later, okay, goodbye, you know, next patient, you know, but actually relate to him when I told her, um, I, I actually, I showed her, um, so JDRF, has made us the 2022 family team champion for South Jersey one wall, That's cool. which is a huge honor. And I showed her a video that we made with Casey um, uh, talking about being in one walk. And she literally started crying because she knows what it means 
to find a cure for type one. She knows what Casey is going through. And for me to finally have like go from a doctor that almost killed my son to someone who would never let that happen because she knows what it means to live with type one. Like I couldn't ask for anything better than that. I feel very fortunate. I was going to ask you, but you left the the first practice so quickly. You don't have an answer for it, but I, but I did wonder, I mean, it's a big mistake. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm not saying it's Mm -hmm. not, but it was one mistake. And so was it as easy as a nurse picked up the wrong piece of paper and read you the wrong numbers? And would that, crappy care have continued or not and i get leaving to not find out because to your point it did have to pass over the eyes of the doctor and you would think that someone would look at a number and go this is a newly diagnosed you know six-year-old kid we just we just gave them a a new chart that's five or six times greater than what we'd given them that doesn't make sense that's not right somebody should have noticed i'm not but i do wonder if you would have stayed like maybe you would have got stuck staying if you would have learned that that was a one-off problem or if you would have continued to have problems like that? Um, I don't think I would have stayed because like, you know, some other examples were like, I just didn't feel like we got enough support. Like I did feel like it was like, okay, we saw Casey now 10 minutes later, goodbye next patient. Mm -hmm. But also it was because like they sent me, it's like they didn't really take the time to know like what our situation is. Yeah. Um, and like they would send me like directions like to download the Dexcom Clarity app so they could see his stats. And for me, like in that time of my life, it was very overwhelming. I'm not like the greatest with technology. And I was like, I called them and I said, like, I would really appreciate it if someone could call me and walk me through this instead of saying, here's another 40 steps on your plate to add to your normal day to day and night to night type one management. Yeah. Like, and so they, they did have a nurse call me because of that and walk me through it. And it did take a while. Like I was on the phone a while going through this process and like, to me, that shouldn't be standard procedure that you just say, Hey, dumped this in their lap too. Like it should be like, Hey, you know, do you need help getting this software downloaded? Like, let me walk you through it. And so the 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 care there wasn't what I think a type one family needs. Like you're trying to do so much on your own with this disease that's so I agree. unpredictable and, and you know chaotic at times and like you're still trying to learn it. You need more support. Like one of my articles says like the first few months in a diagnosis, you should be seeing someone monthly. You shouldn't be seeing someone every three months. Mm-hmm. You know, like you should and you should have someone checking in with you weekly you know, hey, how is it going? Because yeah. there's definitely some adjustments in insulin dosing that you could do like after you see a week, oh, this isn't working. Please. But the new parent in this is like, I don't know, is it just me messing up? Right. But in the end, it could just be the insulin chart is not good enough. It yeah. needs to have adjustment. More contact with somebody would be really beneficial. You know, yes. Yeah, so- it's funny you brought up the Dex, like just like here, download this thing. You know, I- I'm going to tell you the truth. For years, my daughter's children's hospital has had a really great on- online portal where you can see your tests and all that stuff. And they always give you a piece of paper like, here, you should get on the online portal. And every time I go to do it, it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And I never finish. And yes. it, and and I do mention it to them. I'll say, hey, I'm having trouble getting on the portal. And they'll say, oh, ask the person out front. They'll give you the instructions. So I've seen the instructions. The instructions uh, suck. And, you know, I can't get on the portal. And then it just gets dropped. Like, it's like, ah, okay. Like, if the online portal is so freaking important, like, to your point, someone go get a laptop and let's get me on the online portal because there's obviously something I'm missing. I don't know what it is. I, I'm a fairly adept computer user. I mean, you know, this, and they'll tell you, like, oh, we hear that from other people. But do you? Well, then maybe change the instructions or fix the port. I don't know. Like, why is it my job to put me yeah, on the it- online portal? You know? it, exactly. There should be way more support for everybody managing this. And yeah, yeah. and just to go back to the other point of why I would leave them is because this new place just handed me a bag full of diabetes supplies that I could not get from the insurance. And the old place was like, oh, well, you know, let's arrange a Zoom call. Let's figure out how to insert a one unit syringe into a one unit pen and try to somehow come across with some half unit dosing from that and like just deal with this whereas the other place was like you can't get this here you go here's like five dexcoms like 
three transmitters, half unit needles, and then like, you know, well, Lisa, more effort into calling the insurance and saying, yeah. hey, Lisa, half what's unit, up? Half unit syringes. That shouldn't be a heavy lift to get you some half unit syringes. Yes. You, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, what are we talking about here? They cost nothing. You, you know, whether you have insurance or I mean, it's, just, it's somebody just needs to get you a prescription so you can get the damn things and be done with it or hand you some samples or something instead of just letting you flounder and making this thing that is already difficult more difficult. You're struggling. Exactly. They're struggling. Exactly. Someone, someone should, should, I take your point. When you're struggling, someone should get you past the struggle, not point out that you're struggling and go, oh, here's a piece of paper. You should go home and download an app. Like, oh, thanks. F*** you. Yeah, like, yeah. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Like, there, there really was, like, no support. And, like, and, of course, someone like my mom who, like, you know, the last 10 years has made it her living to try to make, you know, medical providers and Probably just the pretty general upsetting public to aware. Her, huh? Of like, this is a full time job. Like, this is more complicated than a job you some people go to every day. Right. And but they walk away with at least a paycheck here. Like, you there's no holidays, no time off. You're not earning any money. You're just like floundering on your own, trying to figure out this crazy complicated disease. Yeah. And like with almost like no support. You know, a lot of our support at the beginning, like I said, came from the town. Right. And in the people that knew what it meant to have type one. Lisa, it's a really interesting mixture, right? Because we live in a society where we say we want to help people, but then our institutions aren't really set up to help them. And, yes. and our, so our attitude is, oh, you got type one diabetes? Mm, that's tough luck. Good luck. But our outward messaging is, you got type 1 diabetes? Oh, no, you have insurance and we're a hospital. Come here and we'll help you. And then you go to them and then the help is lackluster at best sometimes. And there are some places where it's terrific. Your, your experience, not good. And, and so even that's going on because you keep saying this one thing, which I think is interesting. It's the idea of like you've been thrust into a thing that you don't want. And yet there's no way for you to avoid it. You have to do it. But there's always that underlying feeling of this isn't even something we did to ourselves. Like we, it's, it just happened. And then there, there's going to be other people who hear that and think, well, listen, that's bad luck. You know what I mean? Like I didn't, I, I had a car accident. I didn't want to have a car accident and my leg broke. And yes. you know what I mean? Like it, in the end, what you're looking at is, is a, a specific story about a bigger picture. And yet somehow, somehow kind of the kindest of us, Right, who the people who become nurses, for great example, like caregivers and people who want to help other people, doctors who say that this is their life's calling, like they all gather together in a place and then are unable or unwilling or don't know how to reform the system that they get put in so that all that all the, the things that they wanted to do when they were younger or when they were in school can actually happen. Because this is just like, medicine's like politics in that you see a bunch of well-meaning people who are like, I'm going to run for Congress and change the world. And 10 years later, this guy's in the pocket of everybody. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, right? Or, or, or you, you know, like a little kid says, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to be a nurse, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to go help people. Then they get thrown into the system and the system runs them over. And, mm-hmm. and, and meanwhile, all this effort and good intentions never reaches the people it's intended to reach. And so instead of this well-oiled machine that could really be, I mean, look at all the man hours and the effort that's being put in by the nurses and doctors. Like imagine if it was directed back into the world in a more, I don't know, well thought out fashion or in a way where it wasn't, you know, strings weren't being pulled by money and insurance and all these other things. All the efforts there, you know what I mean? All the efforts there, all the people are there. And the outcome's not there. Yes. And like everyone questions to this day why it's not just a standard procedure to test kids' blood or their urine at a checkup, a yearly checkup. Like I've seen that question like so much. And I know JDRF is trying to change that, but yeah. it's like. Well, Lisa, you know what the answer so to that question people, is, though, there's right? There's so many medical doctors out there that have no clue what type one is to this day. They have. They clearly haven't been trained in it. They don't know what even symptoms to look out for because we all know it's misdiagnosed as flu, strep, stomach bug, growth spurt. You know, to this day, 
And it's like every time I see like a new family diagnosed on one of these support pages, I'm joined to my heart just hurts because yeah. I know what they're going through. And it's like almost like inevitable that that's going to happen because there's the like another reason for me wanting to spread awareness is because doctors, if you're going to be like a physician, you need to be aware of type one mm -hmm. and the incidence of it is increasing. I mean, the statistics in the future don't look good. I mean, the incidence and rates in children are increasing. And the general public doesn't realize that 93% of people that get type 1 have no family history of it. And it is going to affect any race, gender, ethnicity, any anybody whatsoever. Like anyone is at risk of getting this. And so even though the percent people are like, oh, there's only like a 1% chance of me ever getting it. No, I, I look at statistics very differently than most people because like I also had a 1% chance of getting a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis blood clot mm -hmm. when my son was born and I got it. You know, my son only had a 1% chance of getting type one. Well, he got it, you know? So like, I don't look at a percentage like that. Like everyone needs to be aware that this could land in your plate or it could land in your friend's plate. If you're a teacher in a classroom, a kid in your class could get it. Like everyone should be aware of what to look out for so that that child doesn't die from DKA or even have to land in DKA, yeah. you know? Well, you know, in the end, Lisa, what you're saying is 100% right, right? In a perfect world, we'd all, we test everybody's urine. We would, you know, everything would happen. But I'm going to tell you right now, like just from what you're saying and a little bit of Googling, there are 73 million children in the United States and... What's it say here? From 2002 to 2015, a study identified 14,638 youths younger than 20 who were newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes, um, 39, 16 newly diagnosed with type 2. Even if the even if I'm finding bad numbers, the, the point is, if there were a million kids diagnosed with type 1 diabetes every year, they're going to tell you, well, that's only a small percentage of the children that there are. And we're going to put our efforts somewhere else. Like, it's 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 whoever makes the most noise. You know, if you really yes. want, if you really want to get, you know, the medical community to test every kid at their well visit, then somebody's going to have to throw a lot of money into it and push really hard against, you know, the the governing bodies of these doctors and force that. Like, no one's going to do it on purpose, and the insurance companies are going to push back because seventy three million tests a year times whatever the insurance company says that test cost is more money. And then they're going to say to you, and then you're going to tell me you're only going to find blah, 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 many. Like, and they're you're going to start talking about people like numbers and not like children. Yes, you're not you know? going to look at them as lives. Right, right. You're, you're going to look at them as just a number. Yeah, because there's somebody somewhere, an actuary somewhere sitting in a room that says, listen, I, and I don't mean, listen, this isn't my, these aren't my words, but this is what I imagine is happening in the, wor the world, right? Like, what are we talking about? A hundred kids die a year from this? That's how they're going to think about it. You know what I mean? Of 73 million, 100 of them die. And they're going to say statistically, you know, not important, except, you know, to those 100 children, of course, and their families, of course. It's yes. the most important thing in the entire world. So how do you get, like, where do you point those resources at? How do you make those decisions? How do you force people to make those decisions in a world where, let's not forget, in this, this is in a world where a nurse, a trained medical person, called you up and said, Hey, start giving your kid five times more insulin than you used to. <laughs> so yes. you're asking a lot, Lisa, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. I, I know. Yeah. Like, I, all I can say is like, at least, you know, through spreading awareness, you know, that's why I said, if I reach one person and they're like, Hey, like, I agree. Oh, like someone peeing a lot could be a sign of type one. Well, maybe 10 years down the road, it's their kid that's, or it's their neighbor's yeah. kid. And they're like, why doesn't my son stop wetting the bed? Like, and they're like, huh, you know, something clicks. Well, yep. and they think back, like if, if even I save one person, you know, or change some person's life in some positive way, like if, if it's not going to be at the higher level system, you know, up mm -hmm. top, then at least I can do what I can, you know, I think, at my level. I think of you, me even in the same way, right? I think of what you're doing and what I'm doing is the same thing. Like we're satellites. We're just, we're amplifying a signal and sending it out farther. Right. Yes. And then these satellites are in a system where they all kind of maybe they don't talk to each other. Maybe they do, actually, where, you know, you're not the only one doing this. I get I guarantee you there's a Lisa in every town across the country. 
Oh, and, I hope so. Right. And they're <laughs> and they're writing for their little local newspaper and making sure that they know. And every once in a while we get a New York Times writer whose kids diagnosed with type one diabetes and they and they do the same thing you did. I've seen it happen mm-hmm. in the past. I had lunch with one of them one time. They had the same feelings you had and they just had a bigger pulpit to yell from. Yes. And they choose something, they pick something they think is important and they amplify. And I did the same thing. Like like Lisa, this is, you know, I'm sitting in front of a number of computer monitors right now and one of them I don't usually track the downloads of the show so carefully, but this is the last like 8 hours of the last day of May for my statistics and mm-hmm. this month just became the most popular month of the podcast ever. And oh, so that's amazing. It, and so I'm watching it and if I told you Rough numbers, this month has more downloads or streams. People get upset when I say just downloads. They're like, but I stream it. Does it count? It counts. If you're listening to the show, it counts. This month has more of those than the first two and a half years of the podcast did. That's amazing. And so sometimes the message you send out, people really want to hear. And then you find ways to turn up the power on your satellite. And then you start reaching more and more people. And you might do that one day. You know what I mean? You might be doing it right now and you don't even know it. You might be reaching more people than you think. Or someone else might read what you wrote and say, I'd put that in my newspaper too. And Yes, I mean, you know, it, it, that's one thing is I was just scrolling my Facebook like not that long ago, a few weeks ago. And on my page, one of my articles shared by someone randomly on a diabetes page that said worth the read. And yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh, it's my article, I, I, you know, yeah. and, and I have no idea how many other shares there are out there because, like, I didn't know she shared that one, you know. But, like, if my words somehow travel, you know, farther, then that's amazing. Good and work. my mom, because she writes on diabetes, her last paper that was published within this last year was in, in an international journal. And she actually cited four my first four articles and, and that one podcast um, we did yeah. uh, for Diabetes Awareness Month with my husband. And so now, like, you know, there are somewhere out there international. But some of these diabetes pages are also like they have people from like Australia and like all over the place. So these people are reading, you know, the Hamilton Gazette all the way out in, you know, places all over you the don't place. Know and, where. Yeah. And, yeah. And maybe they're sharing it with their people and, and maybe my word will spread further than I'll ever know. Yep. You know, I don't know, but if it does, that would be amazing. Um, I never, like I told you, my goal was to reach one person just like yours was. And, right. and if it, and if it gets bigger and farther than that, then I will die a happy person, you mm-hmm. know? <laughs> Lisa, I'll give you some examples. Um, this month in the United Kingdom, more people listen to my podcast than listen to it worldwide in the first year it was out. Wow. Yeah. And in Australia and Canada, New Zealand, the United Arab Emirates, Germany, Sweden, Ireland, the show is in every country in the world. And it was not my intention. I did not think that would happen. And And I really just, I really was just doing what you've described earlier. I had seen something. I thought it was unfair for other people not to know about it. And I said, I wonder how many people, one, 10, a hundred, I could reach and hopefully make their lives easier or healthier or something. And now here I am, it's 2022. I wrote that first blog post in 2007. It's a long time ago. <clears throat> you know, so it wasn't, yes. over, it wasn't instantaneous or overnight or anything like that, but it actually ended up working. And, and I just, I love your story. I think what you're doing is really wicked cool. And, and I hope you keep doing it. And I was happy to, to let you come tell the story here today. I have to go, I'm running out of time, but is there anything that we didn't talk about that we should have? Did we miss anything? Um, no, but like, I don't know if you're able to link up any of my articles in the podcast notes, but I'm happy to share them if anyone wants to read them. Um, like I said, like they, or, or meant to just spread awareness, but also to help people in your community, family, friends, or otherwise, just understand like what sure. you may be going through. Yeah, and, I'd be happy uh, to. You, you, um, send me the links, and uh, when it posts, I'll put them up. Yes, and and I will never forget. I have to end by saying this: I will never forget <laughs> that you said when someone asked how you got on 
the juice box podcast <laughs> to say do you remember what you said oh god lisa what did i do what did i say <laughs> that i sent you a message way too long to read so that it was just shorter and faster to interview me <laughs> <laughs> and lisa to call this an interview really is specious to begin with because you are chatty i i found myself thinking you might not know what your husband and children's voices sound like <laughs> <laughs> you you are such a good talker like you get going and you just you know what you want to say and you're clear and concise and you tell a good story um do you let the other people in your house talk or no oh my gosh i'm i'm actually um more laid back in my house than my husband um but the funny thing that you mentioned that is my husband said oh you could talk about type one all day so you'll be fine i like and my mom was like lisa you're always so well spoken you have nothing to worry about no no you were terrific yeah, you really were. And and I was happy for it. But there was a couple of times where I'm like, I've got to run her over so I can say my thing here. I was like, Lisa, Lisa, Lisa. And then the problem, Lisa, is when I do that, my brain goes, Lisa, Lisa, cult jam. And then I <laughs> then I lose my thought for a second. But no, you were terrific. I, I was thrilled to have you on. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. Thanks also to the Dexcom G6, dexcom.com forward slash juice box. See your blood sugar, the number, the speed, and the direction. All in one little look. Swipe up on that phone, pull out that Dexcom receiver, and the information is right there. Set your alerts and alarms where you want them. Dexcom makes that up to you. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Thank you so much to Lisa for coming on the show and sharing her story. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all of you listening. Please don't forget to subscribe or follow in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, wherever you listen, and tell somebody else about the show. That's how it grows. Uh, what else? Check out the private Facebook group, Juicebox Podcast Type 1 Diabetes on Facebook. And don't forget the, the website, juiceboxpodcast.com. All those different series, After Dark, Defining Thyroid, Bold Beginnings, Pro Tip, all that stuff is at juiceboxpodcast.com. There's a big list of them there. You can actually listen to them online if you want, or you can just use the list to refer back to your podcast app. It's completely up to you.